this on again? Okay. Um, sorry. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the title of my talk is The Hotspur Property, uh, which is uh, an allusion to sort of a motto of sorts um, of the subject of my book, um, which is John Horton Conway, and the book is Genius at Play. Um, before I get to that precisely, I thought I would give you a bit of um, background on myself and to, to give you some context, uh, my trajectory as a writer and how I came to write not one, but two books about geometers. Uh, my first book uh, was about Donald Coxter, and he's there on the left. Um, he was at the University of Toronto for his career. He was born in London in 1907 and went to Cambridge for his schooling and then came over to the University of Toronto. Um, and it was actually through Coxter that I discovered my second subject, John Horton Conway, who was born in Liverpool in 1937 and then uh, studied at Cambridge and was there for the first half of his career until he was 50 and then he decamped and crossed the pond uh, and went to Princeton for the rest of his tenure where he's still active. Um, so how did I get here with these somewhat strange bedfellows, especially since I have no formal training in mathematics myself? Um, I loved math in grade school. In grade six, I can remember being particularly fond of my geometry kit, and I you know, whizzed through all the arithmetic uh, multiplication tables when you, you were speed tested in class. And I guess I did well enough that I ended up skipping grade seven math, which turned out to be a bad idea, uh, because thereafter, mathematics was my worst subject by far. Um, but I kept at it uh, for whatever reason. Um, I think one of them was that I was fairly competitive and I was a keener and my girlfriend was very good at mathematics so she kind of pulled me along. Uh, and also it was kind of an excuse to call up my friend Rob Ward at home at night and you know that's one good reason to call the boys you need help with your math homework and that was sort of one other reason that kept me moving along in mathematics. But I did keep up with uh, science and science was um, a favorite topic as well as all the arts and literature, English, history subjects. So when it came time to go to university, I flipped the coin uh, and ended up taking a degree in history. And that was followed by uh, a degree in journalism. And then for my first job, I ended up at the National Post, which had just been established by the great Lord Conrad Black of Cross Harbor. Um, and the Post was a great thing for journalism uh, in Canada at the time. It really sort of invigorated the scene and. Uh, it instigated a competition between the Globe and Mail and the Post. So it was a great place to start out um, as a writer. Uh, but of course, the paper is a very conservative paper, capital C conservative. And it was, in a way, also kind of capital H harebrained in some of the coverage. So I found it was good to always have a stash of ideas on hand that when an editor, you could sort of see them coming down the aisle towards your desk and they would. You know, they'd have some crazy story about a cat stuck in a tree and, you know, what this meant for society or, you know, a political story that wasn't quite up my alley. It was always good to be able to say, actually, I'm hard at work on a piece about the Archimedes palimpsest, which was actually the first story at the Post that kind of reunited me with my interest in my background in uh, science. And this was a, a palimpsest. It was a prayer book um, from hundreds of years ago that had been discovered um, to have been, it was a book that was compiled by cutting up an older book which happened to contain a, um, one of the works of Archimedes which had hitherto uh, not been thought to have been saved in any form. So Archimedes' notebook had been cut up and scraped clean and they'd written the prayers over top of it. Um, and when it surfaced and it was studied scientifically, they discovered these, these writings of Archimedes. So it, it was being auctioned off in 2000, the year 2000, at Sotheby's in New York, and I wrote about that. Um, and then I thought, well, there must be a, a mathematician in Toronto that I could write about. And good old Google, I typed in Toronto mathematician, and up popped um, Donald Coxeter everywhere. Um, he was still at the University of Toronto, it seemed, and he would have been about 90 then. Uh, so I looked him up in the phone book. And I called the number, 
And his daughter answered, and she said, I'm terribly sorry, but my father is still at work. He'll be home at around 7. So Co Coxeter was, was 90 years old, and he was still going into the office at the University of Toronto. He was still traveling to conferences, um, and he was still, you know, as passionate about geometry as he'd been his entire life. So I immediately, you know, got on that story um, for the National Post, and then I wrote a magazine piece for Toronto Life, and then that became a book. Um, so I'll give you a, a little sense of Coxter's uh, life story. Here he is as a young fellow, which would have been probably about 13. Um, here he is at Cambridge, working hard. Many mathematicians credit idle time for their moments of inspiration. Um, but Coxeter was, I was interviewing a lot of people. Not being a mathematician or a scientist, my process is really to interview a ton of people, report, 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 and that's how I do my research, and that's how I kind of get a handle on the subject. Um, and as I was interviewing people, everybody was saying one of a few things. One thing they would say was, well, he's the king of geometry. He absolutely is, is just the, you know, the apostle of geometry in the modern, modern day. Uh, some people were saying he's the greatest living classical geometer. And something else I heard was that he was the man who saved geometry. And here is a caricature of him exhuming geometry from its grave. Uh, because in the, for the most part of the 20th century, geometry was out of fashion. And what was more in fashion was algebra, uh, dealing with you know, the more symbolic ab abstract representation rather than the visual solids. Um, so Coxeter kind of, he saved, saved geometry in a way. Um, that might be a bit hyperbolic, to put it that way. Uh, but he really maintained um, the flame, kept the flame burning throughout the 20th century. And then with the advent of the computer, starting, I guess, about, you know, in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, which was a vi very visual medium, that sort of reunited with, with geometry, and geometry had a, a renaissance as the computer uh, sort of brought it up and, and spread it into various domains with animation and so forth. So these are the, the things I was hearing as I was working on the Coxter book. I also noticed that geometry was coming up in so many places in everyday life, including at the car rental lot in Belleville. Um, but Coxter, in terms of the way he studied, geometry, he was very interested in symmetry. And the most common form of, of symmetry is perhaps mirror reflection symmetry. And from the time he was at, at Cambridge, he would carry around this portable set of kaleidoscopes, mirrored kaleidoscopes, and he actually had them custom cut, and he had velvet pouches that he would slide them into, and he'd carry them around to wherever he wanted to do his investigations. Because when you put a prop in a kaleidoscope, here's a very simple one that's actually just two mirrors, and you can see the whitest triangle there is reflected in the mirrors, and that produces the square. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how he was investigating symmetries, mirror symmetries and reflective symmetries, and then there's also rotational symmetries and so forth. Here's a dodecahedron reflected in a slightly more sophisticated kaleidoscope, and this is an Archimedean solid. And here is Coxter doing a documentary showing how he used his kaleidoscopes. And he did have a, a wry sense of humor. He put his dog, Nico, into the kaleidoscope. And Nico was a bit puzzled, of course. Um, but this is a classic shot of, of Coxeter. And what he's holding there is a stellated icosahedron. It's one of the platonic solids sort of drawn out at various points into this pointy, um, creating this pointy creature almost. And all, sort, all these solids within geometry of a certain classification are called polytopes. And so something else I heard while I was researching Coxer's story was that he was called Mr. Polytope. And while investigating and classifying these symmetries, he really sort of ordered them and classified them and extended their reach into the sciences. This is what uh, Coxter had to say about investigating them in higher dimensions, so not just you know, flat one dimension or two or three going up into four, five, six, seven, eight dimensions. He said that's as far as he could go, was eight dimensions. So he said, we can never fully comprehend them by direct observation. In attempting to do so, however, we seem to peep through a chink in the wall of our physical limitations 
into a world of dazzling beauty. Such an escape from the turbulence of ordinary life will perhaps help to keep us sane. So as I was writing about the various applications of geometry, um, one thing I discovered was a theory about the dodecahedral universe. And I actually followed Coxer to the last conference he would attend in Budapest. And this is where we encountered this theory. It was by a freelance geometer from New York. And being a freelance writer, uh, which is a bit of a, a grind, I would say, I was very surprised to meet a freelance geometer. And I thought, well, I thought I had it bad as a freelance writer. I mean, imagine being a freelance geometer. Um, but Jeffrey Weeks is actually doing quite well. He won one of those genius prizes where he was awarded $250,000 with no strings attached a number of years ago. Um, and he was at the time, this was about 2003, working on a theory about the possibility that the universe was, in a sense, shaped like a dodecahedron. Um, and he was uh, working with some cosmologists, and they were um, analyzing the data brought in from the WMAP probes and so forth. And they were quite hopeful for a time, although unfortunately, ultimately, it turned out that it is not the case. The data didn't quite match up with their theories, so we're not living within a, a dodecahedral universe. But here's Coxeter at the conference looking at what was a 3D animated version of that universe, and he was quite intrigued. Um, so as I was talking to all these people about Coxeter, other mathematicians um, in Toronto and, and really around the world, because he really was quite uh, well known internationally, Another thing I heard again and again was that I had to talk to John Horton Conway because Conway was a protege of sorts of Coxeter's. Um, he never was his student, formally speaking, um, but he really regarded Coxeter as one of his heroes uh, from a young age. And he wrote to Coxeter when he was at when Conway was at Cambridge. He, he wrote to Coxeter. He'd been reading his book, Regular Polytopes, um, about symmetries. Um, and so I sought to find Conway, which was no easy task, as it turns out, because he's not very communicative in the traditional fashion. He doesn't answer his mail. Um, he's sort of infamous for his offices being a tip, and you can't open the door because there's this big mountain of mail piled up behind. Um, and often there are numerous checks in there, so he's known to, to not ever really have cast, cashed a check that was sent his way. And, Hence, he has um, some financial difficulties now. Um, but I, so I couldn't reach him by mail, couldn't reach him by email, because although he was an early adopter of email, uh, once it became a popular medium of communication, he got way too many emails, and he just couldn't cope with all these emails that would come in. He would say, you know, I'd send one out, and five would come back. It was crazy. Um, and he also didn't have a cell phone for the longest time and didn't pick up the phone in his office because he was never in his office because it was such a mess and he was always working in the common room. So it was hard to track him down. Um, but ultimately, I did track him down because I heard he was going to be at a math camp in Maine um, for kids aged 5 to 12. And so I organized. I was sort of on the math beat by now. I'd written my book about Coxeter, and I decided to focus on mathematics and science. Um, and so I went to math camp and wrote a story for the Globe and Mail. And when I got there, I found Conway. And this is roughly what I found. This man with shorts, dirty, filthy t-shirt, either barefoot or wearing sandals. Um, so a total contrast from Coxeter. Coxeter is this, was this very refined Edwardian gentleman, very reserved, restrained, repressed even. Um, although, you know, an elegant and, and beautiful character. Uh, and Conway was just this sort of mad, crazy scientist, um, you know, down in the muck with these kids, staying up all night doing math. Um, and so he told me lots about um, Coxeter. Uh, and I'm sort of getting the, the timeline tangled a little bit, but I was still talking to him about Coxeter. But he would also talk to me an awful lot about himself. And so he would answer my questions about math camp. And I was trying to sort of draw out a, free, a few um, stories from my book and pursue them in other areas. And he would, he would answer my questions. But he would also tell me about his, you know, his three wives and his, you know, he had affairs with more women than he could count. And he's a world authority on infinity. So one would expect that that might be quite a high number. Um, 
but he would also tell me about his attempted suicide and his triple bypass surgery and he was sort of this crazy confessional character who had stories about his life about crashing uh, and sleeping at the Kremlin um, and seeing Oliver Cromwell's skull at Cambridge and the stories just went on and on. So I thought immediately, here is a book. Um, I knew that he would be my, my next subject. However, initially when I pitched it to him, he said, absolutely not, never. Um, he said that the reason being was that he had too many skeletons in the closet and, and most of them being female. Um, but then he had a stroke in 2006 and I think he sort of started to feel his mortality a little bit. And he's also, uh, there's no way to put it other than to say he's, a, he's, he's got a huge ego. He, he is a, a self-admitted, self-described egomaniac. And he's, he is this in a very charming way and a very playful way, uh, but he, he does have a very healthy ego. And so he ultimately, I think, was, was swayed by the factor that you know here he had someone offering to write his biography and, and that would mean uh, a good deal of attention. And so he ultimately let, let me uh, proceed. So here are a few shots of Conway. Here he is as a first year student at Cambridge. And you know not only were Coxter and Conway different in terms of personality, but also as mathematicians. Uh, Coxter was very much focused as a geometer and the beauty of, of polytopes and symmetry. And Conway would call himself, first and foremost, a geometer, but he's very much a magpie. And so I've spoken uh, throughout the book about his promiscuous curiosity. You know, he was not only promiscuous with women, but he was also promiscuous in following his interests wherever, wherever his nose took him. And so here you see him with Winnie, um, which was his water computer that he constructed at Cambridge as a first year student. And um, it was run by the flushing mechanism that he observed in urinals. Um, so essentially it's kind of a, a binary calculator. And you pour in some water at the little cup at the top and pour in some more and then it works its way down and it does calculations. So he came up with many crazy contraptions like this at Cambridge and he was very much a performer. Here he is mugging. Um, and here he is on sort of a caricature of him with another of his creations called Fractran, um, which is really too bizarre to even explain. It's explained in the book if you want to delve in. Here he is in his Cambridge office, which is quite a mess, enjoying a puzzle or two. And um, he says that he never spent a day actually working. That's sort of his, his line. And it was funny because we were in London recently uh, doing a radio interview for the, the book, and the host set, introduced us and said, you know, John Conway and, and his biography, which is titled Genius at Work. And Conway just thought that was hilarious because he, he really maintains that he's never done a day of work in his life. He's constantly playing and kind of tinkering and thinkering and noodling and, and you know, he would play backgammon constantly in Cambridge. And here there's a general strike on, the power is out, but still they're playing backgammon by candlelight. And so this is how he operated. He kind of played with games. He played, um, you know, sort of making up games, analyzing games. He was also very interested in stars, and he memorized all the stars in the sky. He would get obsessed with pine cones or daffodils. So he really had this very peripatetic, promiscuous curiosity. Um, and he at once was very unapologetic about it, uh, but he also worried, being at Cambridge, just a, a young mathematician, that he hadn't really done anything to make his, his name. And so he was feeling guilty about having his position in the 1960s um, and worried that, that he was going to get sacked, essentially, um, feeling very guilty. And he, at that time, had a, a young family. He's been married three times um, and now has seven children, but here are his, his four girls in the, six, in the 1960s. They were born uh, one, two, and three years apart, conveniently enough. It wasn't intentional, but it worked out nicely for a mathematician. Um, so he was worried about his job and, and feeling he really had to do something to make his name. Um, 
but at the same time feeling he had this, he calls it his black blank. There was just nothing there. I mean, he was having fun with these recreational pursuits, but he felt very kind of dark and, and uninspired on the, on the grand scale until about 1969. And then he had what he calls his Annus Mirabilis, or his miracle year. And in that year, he made three big discoveries in the space of about 12 months. He says it's either 1969 or sometimes he rounds it up to 1970. Um, and so the first of those was uh, the Conway Group, which is an entity in the sea of mathematical symmetry, if you will. Um, it's like one of those polytopes that Coxter was holding. Uh, this is actually a group known as E8. Uh, it's not the Coxter or the Conway Group. Um, but it's a nice, a nice rendering to give you a sense of how these groups are very symmetrical. Conway thinks of it, likes to think of, of symmetry groups as Christmas tree ornaments. They're these sort of very starry, twinkly things. They rotate around and you can look at them from different perspectives and see something slightly different. Sometimes when they turn, they look exactly the same. Um, but searching, the search for symmetry groups in the mid 20th century was a, a going concern in mathematics. And there was something called the classification project, um, whereby hundreds of mathematicians were seeking to enumerate all the groups that existed. And so Conway, with his first big discovery, he had essentially been given a tip uh, that a group may exist over in this one corner of the, the mathematical sea of symmetry connected to a lattice. Um, so there was some indication that a group should be there. Um, but nobody had found it yet, and he decided that he would try and find it because he knew that if he did manage to find it, it would make his name um, and sort of solve his problem of feeling guilty and feeling that he hadn't um, done anything in mathematics. And so it's, it's with respect to this discovery that he refers to the Hotspur principle or the property. And I'll just uh, read a short section from the book to give you a sense of both Conway and what he was thinking in terms of the, the Hotspur property. So, as is the tradition, Conway's discovery became known as the Conway Group. And that group was the largest of three simple groups nested together, sometimes collectively called the Conway Constellation. So this was a huge coup. He'd found one massive group which had, in, a, in, in its essence, had added four groups to the classification project in terms of hunting for all these symmetry groups. So this was the hot mathematical news of the day and earned him a cosmopolitan array of lecture invitations. He flew to Paris, Gottingen, Montreal. During a trip to Montreal, there was eight inches of snow. Conway, as per usual, was wearing only his sandals. He arrived at the venue with wet red feet and kicked off his frosted leather tangles and lectured barefoot yet again. Finding the group kicked off Conway's jet set life. He'd fly to New York, de deliver a single lecture, turn around, fly back home. This breakthrough cleared the way for his white-hot discoveries, discoveries summoned via a force that he whimsically, grandiosely, gives a Shakespearean name, the Hotspur property, after the char character Hotspur in King Henry IV. In Act Three, Glendower says, I can call the spirits from the vasty deep. Hotspur replies, why, so can I, or so can any man but will they come when you do call for them? For Conway, now they would, and the results came thick and fast. As Samuel Johnson characterized Hotspur, he was at once the comic butt and tragic hero, displaying a noble madness. Although inflated with ambition and subject to turbulent desire, Hotspur was a man able to do, able to do much and eager to do more. So was Conway. But it's at this juncture in his lifeline that he made what he calls the vow. Thou shalt stop worrying and feeling guilty. Thou shalt do whatever thou pleaseth. He surrendered to his peripatetic curiosity and followed it wherever it went, whether toward recreation or research or someplace altogether non-mathematical, such as the longing to learn the etymology of words. Pendiculate versus paniculate. Eubiety versus uberity. Uberus and ubigorous. Eubiety, meaning wareness, versus nullibiety, meaning nowhereness, all of which has next to nothing to do with ubi the, <laughs> the ubiquitous use of ubiquitous. He can also trot out a good riff on the number of words related to the word number. 
Num is one of them, he says. Nemesis is another. What happens is that number is an old Indo-European word, and it originally meant something like share. The floods came and the land was divided again, and you queued up to get your share. Somebody who is nimble is somebody who is quick at taking their share. Num, the past participle of nim, literally means taken or seized, deprived of one's senses. And then nemesis is basically your share of what fate has in store for you. So Conway's fate was to do all the stuff he had formerly feared his fellow mathematicians might flossy nossy nilla pilificate. Flossy nossy nilla pilification is perhaps his favorite word. He reckons it's the longest word in the Oxford English Dictionary, and he recites nearly verbatim the OED's definition, the action or habit of estimating as worthless. His telling of its etymology checks out as well. It is a Latin-based word invented circa 1730 at Eton, a schoolboy's joke, as a schoolboy's joke. Consulting a Latin textbook, the student found four ways of saying don't care and stuck them together. Flossy, a wisp of wool. Nossy, a trifle. Nilly, nothing or something valueless. Pilly, a bit or wit, something small and insignificant. And then farce, to make. Conway had long maintained, publicly anyway, that all his noodling around, his compulsion for trivialities, playing games, memorizing stars, counting petals, and playing back backgammon was worthless for all practical purposes. Regardless, he now could be the living, breathing embodiment of don't care. As he says, before everything I touched turned to nothing. Now I was Midas and everything I touched turned to gold. So that gives you a, a sense of the sort of transformation he went through um, in the in 1969-1970. Now I mentioned that um, he had three discoveries in, in that one Annus Mirabilis. Um, and so the, the second one, I'll just skip through some zooming in on the E8. The second big discovery was called the Surreal Numbers which is in the field of infinity. And it added a tremendous amount of numbers to the number line, essentially. And you may think that the number line was kind of a done deal, um, but this is, proud, this is Conway's proudest discovery, discovering surreal numbers. And they are surreal in the sense of Salvador Dali. They're very bizarre, weird, unearthly. They're unreal, in a sense. They're very hard to wrap the brain around. Um, and in fact, a broad way to think of them uh, is that they are the largest possible expansion of the real number line. So the real numbers are 1, 2, 3, as well as the fractions, as well as irrational numbers like pi. Um, but the surreal numbers go above and beyond and below and within, and they gather in all the infinites and all the infinitesimals. And I sort of like to think of them as sort of the numerical equivalent of fractals. Wherever you look, you know, going out or going down, there's a repeating pattern of just more and more and more slicing off. And that's, that's sort of what happens with the surreal numbers. Um, and interestingly enough, Conway discovered these numbers while he was analyzing people playing games in the Cambridge Common Room. Uh, it wasn't backgammon. He couldn't uh, find any way to, to make backgammon work for mathematical research. Um, but it was the game Go. And he would watch people play the game Go, which is, involves just stones on a grid. Um, and he noticed that as, as two people were playing, the board would be covered and it would sort of break up into small games happening at various parts of the board. And he would start to analyze the games going on in various sections and how one player was ahead of the other. Um, and ha as he was watching these games, as he describes it, the numbers sort of fell out of the games in the analysis. So if you think of an Escher, um, drawing where he, he often has a repeating pattern and there's blue fish going one way and say yellow birds going another way and what happened with the discovery of the surreals was Conway was looking at the, at the games, say the blue fish, and then all of a sudden he sort of had this perspective shift, shift and he saw the numbers which would be the birds going the other direction. Um, so he's, the prou he's proudest of the surreals because he really um, believes as, as do most people, um, that it's a very profound contribution to the study of, to the, the oeuvre of mathematics. 
And his one regret is that in his lifetime, he, he doesn't think he's going to live to see them applied. And he really wanted to see them applied sort of in a, a broader sense, either mathematically or in uh, the sciences. And um, I was talking to Peter Sarnak, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study and also at Princeton, trying to get some you know, objective assessments of the surreals. And he said, there's no question that the surreals will be applied. It's just a question of uh, where and when it probably will be in a couple hundred years, which is so often the case um, with mathematical, pure mathematical discoveries. They don't sort of find a, a broader purpose for quite a while. Uh, so that was, that was the second discovery that Conway made in that Annus Mirabilis. And then the third was the game of life. Um, not the board game, the game of life. It's a cellular automaton. Um, so it's a no-player, never-ending game. And here you can see Conway playing it or investigating it on a very early computer. Um, the game of life turned out to be a model for the science of emergence. Uh, the science of complexity and the idea that complexity emerges from simplicity. Um, it's essentially a model for the science of emergence, uh, the science of complexity and the idea that complexity emerges from simplicity. Um, it's essentially a little machine, very simple, um, that is governed by three simple rules. And so you set, you can sort of see the dots on the screen. You either set the dots on the screen or stones on the board again, a more crude, that's how he initially investigated it. Uh, with stones on a, a grid on a board. And then from one iteration to the next, one sort of tick of the clock to the next, the cells um, proliferate according to these three rules. Um, and oftentimes they sort of explode, and it would be like looking at a, um, cells under a microscope, or, or sometimes they vanish and collapse into nothing all of a sudden. Um, so Conway had been investigating. He had this idea. Um, he wanted to uh, do this sort of thing. It was based on an idea of Turing's, and Conway was tinkering with it for, he estimates, you know, possibly two years. He was trying to find the best rules. Um, so again, it's, it's his idea of, of somehow being able to conjure up you know, just the three simplest, most elegant rules that had this tremendous, beautiful, exquisite effect of producing um, the game of life, which turns out is an analog for life itself, as well as all of mathematics, as Conway describes it, and um, in many ways the universe on the broadest possible scale. Um, now, unfortunately, Conway is, is best known for life because it really developed a cult status. Um, it sort of transcended mathematics um, and computer scientists and really any, anybody interested in mathematics and science uh, sort of had an encounter with the game of life at an early age. And so he became known for this more than anything else, and that really started to piss Conway off, um, especially as he's, he's gotten a bit older. And he would, you know, as I mentioned, he's got a huge ego, and so whenever he would see a new mathematics book that had been published, he would look up in the index to see, you know, where Conway stood in this new book, and he would more often than not find his name, and the only thing that would be listed would be the game of life. Um, and so this really started to tick him off. And, and now he, he's, he's quite likely, if you mention the game of life, to, you know, sometimes in a mock way, but sometimes kind of serious, seriously throw a bit of a tantrum. And he'll, you know, scream, I hate the game of life, and I hate life. Um, and so it was, it was very tricky uh, writing the book, having to explore this major element in his, his life history. Um, but he didn't want to talk about it. And so this chapter is called Character Assassination because that's how he came to view uh, my questions about the game of life. Whenever I would uh, approach him and ask questions, he would, he would throw a bit of a wobbly. And sometimes I managed to get enough out of him, but on other times I had to borrow from sources that had talked to him about life you know, 20 or 30 decades ago, uh, or 20 or 30 years ago, two or three decades ago, when he was more... Um, fond of it still. Uh, but he does come in and out of it, and sometimes he, he does admit that, you know, in some ways he's kind of proud of it. But he really would rather be known for the Conway group and the surreal numbers. Um, so that gives you a sense of Conway. Um, you know, he made these three big discoveries which set his course as a, a mathematician. 
Um, and from then on, he, you know, he continued in any number of fields. He continued, he abided by his vow and he followed his, pure, his curiosity. Um, he had discoveries in knots and sphere packing and there's a patent uh, that he took out with a friend in, in relating to coding theory. Um, he's also known as a fantastic teacher and expositor. Um, and so when I was writing the, writing the, the book, one question was, um, how do I capture this aspect of Conway? Because it really is a defining aspect that he's able to sort of uh, almost entrance or um, intoxicate his students and people who, who listen, to him, listen to him talking about mathematics. And I was talking to, when I was talking to Peter Sarnak, I also asked him, in addition to talking to him about the surreals, I said, well, how would you distill Conway down? Um, if you had to describe him in one word, what would you, what would you say? And he, he said, well, he's a seducer. And then he sort of thought for a minute and he said, no, actually, he's the seducer. And Peter Sarnak, he wasn't referring to his, you know, way with women, which uh, was clearly um, well evidenced. He was referring to the effect that Conway has on his students and on his colleagues um, when he's, he's talking about his discoveries or when he's teaching something, he really does have this very charismatic, sort of magical way of presenting um, ideas and entrancing people, drawing them in. And when he was at Cambridge, there was something called the John Horton Conway Appreciation Society. Um, and everybody who, who uh, you know, appreciated his, his style and his passion sort of automatically belonged. Um, so of course, when Conway read the book, he was read, read my Book, he was quite, um, you know, tickled to find himself described as the seducer. He was stroking his ego a little bit, um, but of course he had to school me on the etymology of the word, um, also being a word nerd. And so he said, the root of the word "deuce" or "duct" means to lead. Um, and at the time we were on a train to Mathfest in Washington, and he said, for example, the conductor leads the train. Um, and a deduction leads from one proposition to another, and a reduction leads back, and a seduction, or a seducer, leads one astray, uh, but in a good way. Um, and I, I think that was that's just such an apt description of the effect Conway had on me. Um, I spent about 10 years with him on the brain, seven years actively writing the book, so I think, you know, I can quite fairly say that I was seduced and that was about the only way I would have the endurance to um, stick at it for so long. Um, but it did present an interesting challenge, um, again, in how, in how to convey him. And so this, uh, this page from the chapter on life, you might be able to see that in the book I gave Conway his own font. Um, so there's the introductory paragraph there is in the serif font, and then most of the rest of um, that text is sans, sans serif, and that is Conway. And I decided to do this for, for two reasons, really. Um, he was such a great, he is such a great expositor and teacher. I figured there's, there's absolutely nothing to be gained by trying to translate Conway, um, paraphrase him, and you know, put him into my words. I mean, what I wanted to do was capture this uh, iconoclastic creative genius, kind of bottle him, and um, you know, have him come alive off the page. Um, so that was one reason uh, that I actually had to give to my. It was a bit of a case in arguing with my editors at Bloomsbury um, to give my subject his own font. It was very, it was deemed experimental for quite a while um, at the publishers, uh, but they went for it in the end, obviously. Uh, but the second, the second reason was that in addition to being uh, a, a mastermind mathematician, Conway is also a masterful storyteller. He loves to talk, you know, and that was my first impression of him when I met him at math camp with, with Coxter. I mean, he, he talked about Coxter, but he just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked about himself as well. And he really casts his life in these tales, and he has this vast repertoire of, of tales. So I thought, you know, it made more sense to sort of share the narrative with him, and I set things up historically in the book, and then, you know, we pass the narrative baton back and forth. So what I thought I would share with you, um, in concluding, one of my favorite Conway tales, 
Um, this is something I think I probably heard the first time at math camp when I first met him, and I heard it many, many times um, over the course of, of researching the book. And we went on a, um, towards sort of the middle of the seven years, we went to Cambridge on a research trip. I, I flew him over uh, and met his, his daughters and his first wife, Eileen, um, because I really wanted to, you know, see him in his element, you know, get a, a sense of the place so I could write about it, but also fact check a few things. Um, and so when I met with his first wife, Eileen, um, I wanted to, you know, ask her some questions and, and the, this story about Oliver Cromwell, which was what my favorite story, um, was one that I wanted to, you know, ask her about because it was just a, such a fantastic story. I wanted to get as many details as I could. And when Conway was there, we, we went to Sydney Sussex College, which is the college he belonged to um, in Cambridge. And it's also relevant to this story. So I'll just read you this passage. So, <clears throat> ever the scouser, Conway came home in the middle of the night and told Eileen about a fabulously odd party he'd just attended. At the behest of Sidney Sussex's master of college, he and select fellows were summoned to a private dinner together with the college chaplain and one Dr. Wilkinson, who had recently donated, donated to the college the head of Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, and a fellow of the college circa 1616. Following his death in 1658, Cromwell was buried briefly in West Westminster Abbey. But when the monarchy that he'd overthrown returned to power, he was exhumed for posthumous hanging and decapitation. His head was set on a spike atop, atop Westminster Hall, and it later went missing, turning up in a museum of curiosities before residing with the Wilkinson family. And now Cromwell's head would be laid to rest in the college chapel. To, he to hear Conway's telling, it was a raucous night with a sumptuous dinner and ample drink. The master led a candlelit procession to the ante-chapel where the chaplain gave a brief service followed by the burial. With the Cambridge research trip fo uh, mostly finished, Conway headed back to Princeton and I stopped by Sydney Sussex College again to ask after Cromwell's skull. The porter escorted me to the ante-chapel and pointed to a plaque on the wall. Near to this place, it said, was buried on 25 March 1960, the head of Oliver Cromwell. When I arrived back in Princeton, I asked Conway for more details. Did he see the skull? What did it look like? Where exactly was this dinner and what did they eat? This time, however, my detailed questions were not greeted with his usual know-it-all enthusiasm. Usually he's happy to just fly off on, you know, tangent upon tangent. But this time he gave me what I came to refer to as his death stare. Yes, he said, that's a great story, isn't it? And I often tell that story with myself playing a supporting role, as if I had actually been there. So this was quite something. He had made it up. He wasn't actually there. Conway hadn't attended the consecration of Cromwell's skull. He no, he no doubt heard rumors of the event, and in an opportune moment when he needed a captivating story to tell, maybe when he needed an alibi, at an alibi he claimed the tale as his own because, well, it was a great story. But it made Conway an accomplished fictioneer and a rather unreliable narrator of his own life. So, I mean, I was floored by this because this was one of my favorite stories. And as a writer, you sort of, or for my own part at least, I sort of go around and I collect tidbits that, you know, inspire me um, and, you know, that I'm putting to get them together in a puzzle. And to contemplate not being able to tell the Cromwell story in the book was just, it was kind of devastating for, you know, not very long, but um, it was a bit crushing. And so, obviously, I decided I just had to, you know, tell it as it is. Um, you know, I was duped by him for a, a good portion of time. And it was particularly um, arresting, you might say, because I was, I was working at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, which is a very, you know, heady place. It's got a faculty of about 100 who are plucked from all the, you know, academic institutions around the world. And, these people are there doing research only. They don't have to teach. And then year to year, um, people come as members and work on a serious project. And you have to present um, what you're working on. 
And right when I had to present, you know, I had just discovered that my biographical subject had been, you know, making things up and lying to me, essentially. Um, and it was just turning into a bit of a gonzo uh, project. So I just, you know, kind of, bore, you know, laid out my soul and my trials and tribulations at my talk. And one of the, um, one of the faculty was very interested. Um, sorry, I missed there's uh, Cromwell. And here is the skull. These are hanging in the, in the college at, at Sydney Sussex at Cambridge. Um, but I told my story about Cromwell and Conway and the fictioneering um, at my talk at the Institute. And I showed them this caricature, which was done by a friend of, of Conway's. And it just so aptly captures his kind of devilish um, nature. Um, so one faculty member, Irving Laven, uh, commented on that. He took an interest in the drawing and offered his assistance in deciphering what it said about Conway's antics. Conway was in good company among artists who matched creativity with promiscuity, intellectual and or interpersonal. Picasso, for example. So maybe Conway's seemingly, seeming inability to distinguish fact from fiction correlated to his uncanny ability to see mathematics differently, to his Hotspur property. <clears throat> and to achieve his idiosyncratically original results. Commenting on the caricature itself, Levin rummaged around for relevant references and pointed to the 17th century Italian artist Gian Lorenzo Bernini as an early ancestor of artists doing exaggerated comical drawings with massive heads to, poke, to malign or poke fun at their subjects. He thought the caricature vividly captured Conway as rapscallion. Very cunning, says Levin, cunning indeed showing dexterity in artfully achieving one's ends by deceit, evasion, or trickery. So that was the subject I had to work with um, over the course of, of this process. And it was mostly fun, I, I will say. Um, but I opened the book. The frontispiece um, has a, a few words of wisdom from Emily Dickinson, which is, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And I, I sort of took consolation in that when I, was, when I was confronted on not just this occasion, but numerous occasions with Conway kind of tweaking, um, tweaking the facts. Um, and I'll just uh, mention by way of closing that his latest um, brainchild, if you will, is something called the free will theorem, which he's devised with uh, his colleague at, at Princeton, Simon Koshin. And so they have claimed that um, they have proved with a theorem that three, free will exists. And it, it borrows um, axioms from quantum mechanics and philosophy and geometry. And it has a very precise technical formulation. Um, and it is a very ineluctable and difficult thing to, to wrap one's brain around. And indeed, they're still grappling with it themselves. Um, but the way they phrase it uh, is this. They say, if a human being or a, a scientist conducting an experiment has free will and only a small amount of free will is necessary, um, then they prove elementary particles possess free will as well. And that goes a long way in proving, they suggest, why human beings have free will in the first place. So if you sort of trust in Conway and his Hotspur power to call the spirits or the truth from the vasty deep, I guess we can all go forth with his theorem of free will and sort of rest assured that we have that, that power in our own lives. So thank you very much, and I, I am happy to answer questions. <laughs>